When I first started posting videos to YouTube about finance and investing, I was really nervous about accidentally providing investment advice on my channel. If you aren't aware, in Canada, the United States, and many other countries around the world, it's actually legal to provide investment advice without being registered. And while I'm now currently registered to give advice, I wasn't when I first started the channel, and even still, I wasn't interested in crossing that fine line. But as I got more familiar with the YouTube finance space, it became pretty clear that this concern was not shared by most other creators. Not only were people openly talking about which stocks and cryptos they liked, talking about where they thought there were opportunities and whatnot, but they were oftentimes telling people what exactly to do with their money. Invest in index funds. Sell out now before things crash. Buy Dogecoin before it hits $3,000. That last one was actually from TikTok, but you get the idea. It was crazy. It's not that all the advice was necessarily bad or speculative, but the fact that so many people were giving advice in the first place without any issue was honestly mind boggling. How could this be? How could all these people be doing what I was told was a cardinal sin in the finance space? Then I saw it. The apparent key to this onslaught of investment advice, the not financial advice disclaimer. Virtually every popular finance video posted on YouTube has this disclaimer in one form or another, including my own videos, mind you. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it, because most of this stuff is financial advice. Telling people how to invest their money and what stocks to buy is clearly financial advice. And while a lot of people fortunately do focus on providing reasonable guidance on YouTube, there are some, and emphasis here on the some, who really do test the limits. You can find some pretty awful advice on the platform, from people providing speculative picks that they think their viewers should go all in on, to really just incomplete research, only to wash their hands clean with a convenient, by the way, not financial advice. But we haven't really seen any penalties for people providing this sort of bad advice on YouTube. Which raises a question, does the not financial advice disclaimer really protect people from any liability here for what they tell their viewers? or are all these YouTubers breaking the law? Well, as someone who lives both in the professional and the YouTube world of finance, I wanted to further explore this topic. So I did some digging, spoke to an attorney, and tried the best I could to see if we were on the cusp of the biggest crackdown in finance YouTube history, or just another regular Friday in the space. Now, I do wanna highlight on a beautifully ironic note that this video is not legal advice. Since I am not a lawyer, I have no formal legal education. I am just a finance guy reading some rules online. And while I will be focusing on US federal laws, rules can obviously vary from country to country and even state by state. But I nonetheless think that it will be helpful to dive into the laws for the biggest market in the world so that viewers can see if they have any protections here. And so that YouTubers can determine whether they should maybe be checking their phone books for any local law firms. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Richard Coffin and you're watching The Plain Bagel. To answer the question of whether the not financial advice disclaimer is a real legal defense for YouTubers, we should first have a better understanding of the law around investing advice as it currently exists. And probably the most applicable law to this conversation is the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. This was a piece of legislation introduced to the US after the Wall Street crash of 1929, which kicked off the Great Depression as many people believe that the market collapse was partially the result of widespread speculation fueled by reckless advising from professionals. It was said even taxi drivers and shoe shines would talk about which stocks they were trading that day. The act essentially made it so that only registered professionals could provide investment advice, while at the same time outlining penalties for providing advice illegally. In fact, under the act, people who are not registered can be fined and may even face jail time of up to five years in federal prison if they provide illegal investment advice. It can also open you up to civil liability. If you illegally recommend a stock to someone and that position declines, you could be sued for the damages. And given how many viewers some of these YouTubers have, that's kind of a scary prospect. But at the same time, there's got to be some leeway here, right? I mean, people talk about stocks all the time, and you don't see the SEC going to water coolers at the office and finding your coworker for telling you what their favorite picks were. Where's the line here? Well, in a 2013 memo, the SEC outlined three criteria for determining whether someone should be considered an investment advisor. Someone who, if not registered, would be giving illegal advice. We'll start with the most obvious of the three. You provide advice to others or issue reports or analyses regarding securities. 
Now, importantly, this line focuses on advice about securities and not financial advice as a whole. So while the disclaimer, not financial advice, would include securities advice and other types of money related things, broader suggestions like you should save your money aren't regulated here, which makes sense. In fact, according to FINRA, you don't need to be registered to even be a financial planner, and virtually anyone can offer financial planning services so long as they don't advise on regulated areas, such as securities and insurance and other areas like that. Even still, you can see how that last part, analyses regarding securities, is pretty damning for YouTubers. It sounds like even just analyzing the stock and giving your thoughts could constitute securities advice. And given how popular that is to do on the platform, that could be an issue. Not only that, but the SEC has been very broad historically with what it considers securities advice. So even just sharing a portfolio of stocks or saying something high level like you think people should have more stocks than bonds would likely fall under this criteria. But there is an interesting caveat here that quite honestly saves a lot of people. Notice that the advice needs to be about securities. Now, you might be aware that securities is a broad classification that includes many investments like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, options, and many other publicly traded investments. But interestingly, the SEC has in the past clarified that real estate, coins, precious metals, and commodities are not covered by this definition. And while the SEC does evaluate cryptocurrencies and NFTs individually, they've ruled that Bitcoin and Ether, the two largest cryptocurrencies, are not securities. And that explains a lot. Probably some of the most audacious advice on YouTube has to do with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And while we've obviously seen a lot of projects pop up that are trying to test the limits and the capabilities of the space, there are also a lot of money grabs in the cryptocurrency area. And it appears that this point of clarification would explain why it's been so easy for people to skirt any liability regarding how these coins are marketed. It's not to say that you can't be found liable for things like fraud. Anyone can be sued for promising returns or a pump and dump scheme. But when it comes to advising about cryptos, it appears that for many of them, it falls outside the legislation here. So right away, a lot of finance YouTubers can probably breathe a sigh of relief as they're off the hook for their non-financial advice, financial advice. But for those that discuss stocks, this criteria still seems to apply. So let's move on to the next criteria to see if it applies. You provide advice for compensation. This is why the SEC isn't raiding the Wall Street Bets subreddit for all the hot picks being posted by users. Yeah, anyway, because it appears that free advice falls outside the scope here. And that makes sense. Free speech applies even in the world of investing, and the SEC probably isn't looking to police every free conversation we have about investing. But it raises an interesting question. Are YouTubers providing advice for compensation? Compared to a professional advisor who would charge a pretty explicit fee for the service they offer, a YouTuber's content is usually free, with the YouTuber instead being paid at times through advertisements or sponsorships that they decide to take on on their channel. Does that count? Well, it's a bit of a gray area really, but the SEC has historically interpreted the compensation requirement pretty broadly to refer to any economic benefit, regardless of how it's received. It doesn't matter whether it's paid directly by the person receiving the advice or not, or even if the advice isn't the sole reason for the fee. A benefit that's generated in relation to you providing advice is considered compensation. So there is a chance this criteria applies but I think the third and final criteria will help further clear this one up. You engage in the business of providing advice. And the SEC has clarified that, quote, generally, a person providing advice about specific securities will be engaged in the business unless specific advice is rendered only on a rare or isolated occasion. That may be interpreted as meaning that someone who presents themselves as an investment expert, who regularly provides investment advice on their channel, and whose investment advice is the reason that many viewers watch their content might meet this criteria. But it's hard to know for sure where that line is. Does calling yourself an analyst or a guru or some other title of profession mean that you're suddenly in the business of giving advice? I honestly don't know. But I do think that the criteria is more likely to apply when you get into some of the many perks that YouTubers in the finance space like to offer. If, for example, a YouTuber runs a pay-gated portfolio of securities, or even one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with their viewers, 
there's a chance this criteria would be met. Now, obviously between this criteria and the other two that we've already discussed, we've already filtered out a lot of people from liability here. But even with the not so clear for compensation rule, I don't think it's a stretch to say that between the various donation and pay gated platforms, there are likely some financial YouTubers out there who have met these three criteria for being registered. So why haven't we seen a YouTuber being sued for the advice they provided? I knew that I needed some help to better understand what was going on here. So I decided to reach out to someone more familiar with US law than myself. Jack Duffley is another financial YouTuber on the platform who I learned works as a commercial real estate attorney in the US. And while not a securities law attorney himself, he is more familiar with the YouTube finance space and had actually written a blog post about this very subject. So I decided to bug him and see what he thought about all this. I pass the question on to you as someone who actually has a legal background. What's going on here, Jack? <laughs> so the Investment Advisors Act lays out a number of exceptions. Anyone who meets one of these exception classes uh, would not have to register under the Investment Advisors Act. So they can actually give investment advice um, in those limited cases. First off, we have to decide that, yes, they are getting paid for financial advice. They're, they meet that for compensation requirement. So assuming that's true, which isn't necessarily the case, the biggest options would probably be either the, the teachers or professionals exemption. That seems like it'd be promising, but really the way the, the SEC has understood and, and the courts have understood the teacher's exemption is that you really have to be a teacher first and then give financial advice as kind of like an outlet. Think maybe like a business school teacher, um, not so much the person whose primary goal on YouTube is to give financial content, give financial advice. And, and it seems like the publisher's exemption is probably the best route, which allows people to uh, distribute certain publications and give financial advice through those without having to register. Okay, so I always knew that there were some exemptions for the act here. It's why you can have some professionals like brokers and mutual fund salesmen who aren't upheld at the same requirements as fiduciary advisors. But I wasn't as familiar with the publisher's exemption. But also, that one makes sense as well. It explains why you can have people on CNBC and other news networks sharing stock picks and never really facing any consequence for doing so. But does this apply to YouTubers? I asked Jack what it would take for someone to meet this exemption. It was clarified in a pretty big case, actually all the way back in the 1980s, called Lowe versus SEC. And in this case, this guy Lowe used to be a registered advisor, but he got in some trouble, so he lost his registration status. And then he started selling a, a newsletter where he was giving stock tips or, or otherwise was giving financial advice and was getting paid for it through this newsletter. They got all the way up to the Supreme Court and trying to figure out whether this guy had to register, was he giving illegal unregistered financial advice? And the Supreme Court said that this actually fell under the publisher's exemption. So someone with a paid newsletter, um, because it met these very specific three factors, the publication is general and impersonal in nature, it's bona fide or bona fide as we like to say in America. Um, and then the third is that the publication is general and regular in its circulation. So Jack, then I'll ask the follow-up question of, if you include this disclaimer, say as kind of extra security, uh, and you assume that you're protected under these exceptions as we saw in that low case, is a YouTuber able to say effectively whatever they want about investments? Do you have free reign to talk about anything on YouTube when it comes to securities? I think it's safe to say that you don't have free reign, like it's you can just say whatever you want. It, it can't be advice that's geared towards a specific person. So maybe a viewer comes up to a YouTuber and says, hey, should I invest in this stock? And then that YouTuber tells that person, yes, you should invest in that stock specifically. It's like individual advice that probably hmm. wouldn't be okay. Whereas the general and impersonal newsletter might be okay. And within the act, there's really nothing about a disclaimer saying, hey, if you do this disclaimer, uh, then you're totally covered. You, you don't have to register to be an investment advisor. It's not really covered in the act. So just because you disclaim it and say, hey, this isn't financial advice, uh, it doesn't just absolve you of all of your sins if you really have sinned under the act. And of course, he did ask me to include this. This is not legal advice. I don't know everyone's individual situation. This is really just looking at a very high level overview of federal law. All right, so thankfully it doesn't sound like YouTube is a total wild west when it comes to finances. YouTubers can still be held somewhat liable for being dishonest with what they circulate. And in fact, while I was working on this video, the SEC actually came out and charged a social media stock promoter for selling out of positions that they were promoting actively on their Twitter handle, Big Money Mike 6 and his email group, Team Billionaire. 
not the most original names, but it goes to show that there are cases coming out against predatory recommendations. But regarding financial advice, it doesn't actually look like the not financial advice disclaimer is what's doing the legwork here. It looks like that between the publisher's exemption and that low case ruling from the 80s, the law might not even apply in the first place. After all, advice on YouTube is inherently being sent out to a mass audience, so of course it's not going to be considered personalized. And if a paid newsletter can skirt liability, some paid YouTube groups might even be in the clear here. Now Jack did explain that it's not to say the disclaimer may not be considered if a case were to make it to court, especially in a situation where a YouTuber is really towing that line of legality. But as Jack puts it, I always think that honesty is the best approach. As long as you're honest, you're not secretly saying, hey, uh, I, I don't have an interest in the security, but you actually do. And then you end up selling it like a, a pump and dump type, th type thing. As long as you're honest, that's step number one. Then we can kind of start looking at, at the, the next steps uh, to make sure that, that you're, you're, you're in line with uh, what the law is trying to do. But I did notice that this does kind of set a weird precedent for stock picks in the space. It obviously sounds like people can't provide personalized advice, which makes sense because that does take caution and training and whatnot, but they're allowed to provide widespread advice to everyone, even if it's potentially bad. Now, I know that no law is perfect, and obviously there are still some protections being provided here, but it is weird to think that saying Tim should invest in this stock is not okay, while saying everyone should buy this stock seems to be allowed under the publisher's exemption. Regardless, it looks like we've come to some sort of conclusion regarding the not financial advice disclaimer. There do remain some unanswered questions when it comes to signal groups, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and other more focused offerings like those. But with or without this disclaimer, YouTubers don't appear to be considered advisors under the law. Now, this could change at any time, and perhaps we'll see an interpretation that does bring more liability to the finance YouTube front. But for now anyway, that's our understanding of the law. Now, obviously I've really gone in here on YouTubers, but of course the same concerns apply to major networks as well. I also don't want this to be interpreted as hate against any one financial YouTuber who talks about stocks. This is not an attempt to gatekeep investment analysis. And I think a lot of people do a really good job with the content they put out. But I do think it is fair to say that the worst of this bad advice when it comes to finances can probably be found on YouTube, which is why I discussed that platform specifically. Maybe TikTok is a contender there, but you get my point. And until the laws are changed, it's largely a viewer beware market. So to end on a constructive note, I think you should listen to what YouTubers have been trying to tell you. Their content is not financial advice and might not be appropriate for you, or in some cases, anyone. <laughs> so don't copy their portfolio. Don't buy anything they tell you to unless it's based on your own research. You can learn a lot from not financial advice, financial advice, but you shouldn't take financial advice from someone not willing to be held to their word. As for YouTubers, as Jack says, be honest, both in terms of your own interests and your level of expertise. And maybe avoid statements about absolutes regarding returns and how successful certain investments are going to be. As we've said plenty of times before, only Sith deals in absolutes. Thanks for joining me today. I know this video was a little different, but I hope you did like it. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe. It does help the channel tremendously. And also check out Jack's channel. He was a huge help in putting this video together. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description down below. I'd also like to pass a question on to you. What do you make of all this? Do you think the system as it currently exists is perfectly fine? Or do you think there should be more restrictions on the type of advice people provide online? And if I have any legal viewers, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. And if you think I've missed anything, as I mentioned, I'm not a lawyer, not an attorney, hashtag not financial or legal advice. And yeah, I'd love to hear what people have to say about the rules that we've talked about. Thank you for joining me today. And as always, be safe out there.